Hey, Joe. Yeah. Hey, this is Allison. I lost this um, slide deck. It just went away. Did I try to? No, it's because Christy's not sharing her screen right now. Joe's sharing like her introductory uh, slides. Are you seeing her video? Yeah, I, I see the video feed at top with everybody. So I just wanted to make sure, you know, it was okay. Yeah. We're going to switch from one to the other. Do you want me to email you the final slide deck, Allison? Uh-uh. No, I'll just follow along. Um, like we did on Tuesday. None of your slides changed. Yeah. We did a few tweaks to mine. And a few tweaks to Chase. Groovy music. Yeah, thanks. Because knowing after about the 20 time, you're like, okay, I've heard that enough. <laughs> I want to hear the rest of the song. <laughs> Hi, Jay. Hi, Allison. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Joe. Hello. Hi, Christy. Where are you? Where am I? No, where, Jay, where are you? Oh, I um, commandeered Dr. Johnson's office here at work. Hello. I was going to say, wow, you got a lot of stuff on your wall. <laughs> well, before nursing school, I have uh, <laughs> four different PhDs, so. Yeah. The lighting's good, though. We were worried. You're, you're not blue. Yes, thankfully. Should I try with the light overhead or just skip it? No, you you're look good. fine. Okay, all right. <clears throat> okay. Um, can I just share my screen real quick, Joe, to make sure that I got it all set up again? Go for it. Okay, thank you. Okay, you can see that okay? Yep. Okay. I'm gonna share back out again though, so hang on. Thank you. Yep. We are being you guys always we are on recording, just so you all know.
All right. I am going to get us started on time. I'm sure we'll still see some more people joining us. So um, good evening and happy new year. And thank you for joining the Northwest Sarcoma Foundation for our first patient education night via Zoom. I'm Joe McNeil, your host this evening and the executive director for the foundation. This, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. Our mission is to provide hope, education and support to anyone affected by sarcoma in the Pacific Northwest while investing in research to impure, improve cure rates for sarcomas. We do this through supporters like you and we thank you for your support. We are excited as the new year launched with so many new programs and events scheduled. During the last few years, we had to sunset a few programs and we are thrilled that they will be returning this year. The Dragon Slayer Fund Pediatric Cancer Days in some of the regional pediatric cancer treatment centers, along with bringing back the community fund days for our HELPS grants recipients. We are also gearing up for our Hope Grows Here events in April and May. We're hosting in three locations this year, Spokane on April 18th at the Wonder Market in the East Hall, Seattle, April 27th at the Seattle Yacht Club in the Fireside Room, and Portland on May 9th at the Imperial Bottle Shop. Ticket sales are open, so don't miss out. Get your ticket soon and join us to provide happy, optimism, positive energy. That's our acronym, Answer to Hope. You can purchase tickets on our website, www.nwsarcoma.org, and go to the events page. Funds raised at these events will help support our mission and fund programs, which leads me to our speakers this evening. Joining us this evening from Kaiser Permanente Cancer Center in Oregon are Nurse Debbie, Deborah Larson. She's been a registered nurse for 15 years, an oncology navigator for seven years, and specializing in sarcoma for four years. Joining Debbie is also Che Richardson Young. He has been a registered nurse for five years and a radiation oncology nurse specializing in radiation oncology for two and a half years. And last but not least, Allison Eshelman. She has been a registered nurse for over 30 years and has specialized in medical oncology for 25 years. Supporting them this evening on the tech side and slide creation is Christy Goodwin. She has been a head and neck nurse navigator specializing in this for five and a half years and a registered nurse for 16 years. We are thrilled to have all of you here and sharing your wealth of knowledge of the years you have with you, with our patients and families this evening. For it, So at this point, I will turn this over to Nurse Debbie and crew. Thank you so much, Joe, and thank you everyone who's taken the time to join us. Um, I am really excited to be here uh, with my colleagues this evening to give you some education. Um, we really just want to do some education around how to prepare and what to expect if you are going forward with treatments with either medical oncology or radiation oncology. Now, before we get started, I do have a couple of disclaimers. We are all registered nurses. We are licensed to provide care in the states of Oregon and Washington. We are employed by Kaiser Permanente of the Northwest, which means we provide patient care in Oregon and Southwest Washington. Now, the material we're pre presenting tonight is uh, written by us, especially for you. It comes from our years of experience, trainings, and certifications. Uh, but as in any cancer care, it is really, really important to remain up to date and to have scientific evidence to back what you uh, are following and, and the guidance you're getting. And so we do have a whole list of references that we are providing at the end of the slide deck um, showing, showing where the information is coming from. Now, today's education is specific to this diagnosis called sarcoma, and we'll get into that more in just a minute. Multiple community resources are going to be presented throughout the course of the presentation. These are all available to cancer patients. There are some eligibility requirements within each program, uh, but none of those are impacted by a person's medical insurance coverage.
Now, again, my name is Debbie Larson, and I am a sarcoma nurse navigator. Now, what that means is that I am most active in a patient's journey at the beginning of their diagnoses. I help with coordinating imaging and referrals to specialty care providers to establish the plan of care. And then I act as a point of contact between all of the departments and specialties that might provide care to a patient. So should someone not know what's happening in their plan of care, they can come back to me and we can continue to work forward. Next slide. So why the call out about sarcoma as the focus tonight? Um, sarcoma is very different than other solid tumor types of cancer. So last year in 2023, the National Cancer Institute reported that 2 million Americans were diagnosed with a cancer. And of those cancers, less than 1% falls under this diagnosis of soft tissue sarcoma, which means this is a really rare type of cancer. Now, the other thing that makes sarcoma different than other types of cancer is that it can present with up to different 50 different pathologic variants. What that means is that our cancer specialists have to have up to 50 different strategies for care because cancer treatments really have to be specific to the pathologic nature of a cancer to be effective. So to make sarcoma even more complicated, it is the number of locations that a person can be diagnosed with a sarcoma. Sarcoma or soft tissue sarcoma is referring to cancer of the connective tissue. Now we essentially have connective tissue everywhere in the body. Um, as this picture shows you, fat, muscles, the lymphatic system. Uh, what this picture isn't showing you is a big circle in the middle of the torso, uh, because we also have connective tissue lining our organs and you can develop a primary sarcoma in between the organs or attached to the organs uh, within the torso. Now, I do wanna make a call out that sarcoma can occur within a bone. Um, this is called an osteosarcoma. Oftentimes when you are reading in literature or trying to understand about sarcomas, you will hear them generally referred to as soft tissue sarcomas, but usually the information is also applicable to osteosarcomas as well. Now, what does all that mean? That means we have a very rare type of cancer that can present with up to 50 different faces, that is really rare in occurrence. That makes this cancer very hard to study and very hard for us to develop effective treatments. And so what you will find is that care plans for someone with a sarcoma diagnosis are very individualized. You may meet someone on your care journey with a similar type of sarcoma in a similar location, but you may have very different treatment plans. So surgery remains the primary treatment for most types of sarcoma, and some people will not require treatment beyond surgery alone. They will go forward with a surveillance model, which is how we watch people after treating a cancer. Now, some sarcomas may be inoperable due to their location, extent of involvement, et cetera, and chemotherapy and radiation may be their primary forms of treatment. Some scenarios will require all three of our cancer modalities, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Now, again, to get back to that complexity of the situation we're dealing with here, the order in which our cancer therapies are provided can also be rearranged based on the location and pathologic variant of a sarcoma. So you may also hear a word or a term called neoadjuvant. Neoadjuvant simply means treatment offered before surgery. This form of therapy can be applied to either chemotherapy or radiation, which means an individual might get those therapies before proceeding with surgery before proceeding with surgery. Now tonight we're really focusing on preparation for chemotherapy and radiation. Um, 
surgery, we could, we could spend a whole night trying to tackle all the ways we manage surgery uh, throughout the various places a sarcoma can present. So tonight is really about radiation, chemotherapy, how to be prepared and what to expect. Now, when you've been referred to either a medical oncologist or a radiation oncologist, that group is going to be building your clinic-based team. You're going to have physicians, nurses, likely pharmacists, and other specially trained therapists. We will have a whole group of people at your cancer center to provide your care. Now, uh, it may feel like we just take over your life and you spend every single waking moment with your cancer care team, uh, but it really is our goal that you be home and doing uh, normal life as much as you can. And so before you begin treatments with either of these specialties, we really encourage you to build your home support team, okay? When people are going through these types of therapies, you cannot expect yourself to feel like you can do all of the things you would normally do in your life and receive these therapies. Mowing the lawn might be just too much. Making a hearty dinner after a long day of treatment might be one too many things to put on your own plate. And so before you start therapy is a really good time to ask those friends and family members around you to like lean in. Um, and you might be pleasantly surprised at how willing people are to step up in these circumstances um, so that you are not going forward on this journey alone. Now, not everyone has a really big group of friends and family. So consider people, you know, within your social network. Are there neighbors that you could ask for a favor? Are there other people in your community? sports, friends, church group, et cetera, who might be able to come alongside of you during this time and lean in with helping you get to an appointment or covering a meal preparation, et cetera. Now, it is um, very much the mission of our host tonight, the Northwest Sarcoma Foundation, to help support people in feeling like they have a community while we're going forward with these treatments. We really don't want people to be alone. And one of the ways that you can receive support as an individual with cancer is through Immerman's Angels. Uh, they have what they call mentor angels. What this is, is this is cancer patients who have completed their treatments and have come back to be screened and trained to provide support to people who are now going through similar cancer journeys. So this can be a person who you can lean on who's been there and done that and really has maybe a little bit of insight that the rest of your care team cannot provide to you. Um, Emmerman's Angels actually has sarcoma trained peer mentors. So that's what's really amazing too, is that despite the rare nature of the situation, this group has really formed those available support people. And we would encourage you to look into those organizations if you think that would be a help to you. Now, inevitably at the time of a cancer diagnosis, um, you had other plans. You did not want to be doing this cancer care journey and inevitably life is gonna throw some things at you that may make it difficult for you to seek the cares that you need. Um, so we are really blessed uh, to have a lot of nonprofit organizations who are focused on supporting people with cancer diagnoses. And so I want to just take a minute to introduce some organizations to you that you may really find supportive as you go forward. Now, every person I touch with a sarcoma diagnosis is introduced to the Northwest Sarcoma Foundation. Uh, this is just an amazing organization. If you are new to learning about them and you just stumbled on them, I really encourage you to do a deep dive into their website and the resources they provide. They have grants for patients and those in the research community, really trying to support um, some of the financial barriers that we have in this situation. They offer chat groups and have lots of activities available to really make you feel like you are not alone in this situation. Another organization that I share with everyone about 
is the American Cancer Society. The American Cancer Society has a 24 hour helpline for anything cancer related. You could pick up the phone at three in the morning and call them to say, how do I get to transfer? How do I get to my appointment? I don't have a ride. And they'll tell you about the road to recovery, uh, which is a program where they screen and train volunteers to help people get to and from treatment appointments. They also have a program called the Hope Lodge, and this helps to provide free or severely reduced uh, hotels for people who need to travel for their cancer treatment. We have a lot of people living in rural areas here in Oregon and Washington. And so sometimes travel is required for treatment. And, you know, three hours back and forth is not always reasonable. And so access to a free hotel can make that treatment journey more feasible. So I definitely encourage you to consider checking out the American Cancer Society at their website for additional information from them. Now, as we talked about right when I got started, sarcoma is really rare and it can be really, really complicated. And so sometimes it feels uh, like a second opinion is in order, okay? Even if you see the top sarcoma specialist, it might help you to talk to another one. And so the uh, Sarcoma Alliance is an organization who helps to provide grants to people to cover the cost of that second opinion consultation. Most insurance companies are not going to pay for you to talk to someone outside of your covered organization. This group can help make that burden of cost a little bit easier and support you in getting maybe a little bit more information about what your treatment options are and, and why the plan of care you've been offered already is being considered. All right, snack in the middle of this picture, I have an organization, uh, Triage Cancer. This group really is here to attack some of the more challenging aspects uh, when seeking cancer care, those around financial and legal situations. So they have free support and navigation services focused on those type of impacts for a person going through cancer. So this isn't about the treatments, this is just about those life things like my insurance policy is changing because I lost my job or I need to figure out how to complete a disability form, or I want to plan for the future and I don't know how or where to start. Triage Cancer has a lot of resources that will guide you through some of these steps, as well as a navigation team that is trained in this subject matter specifically. The last one I have on this page today is the Patient Advocacy Foundation. This group provides free navigation services for complex chronic illnesses and cancer falls under that umbrella for them. They have a search engine to help people find information about disease processes. They have a search engine for financial assistance and they also have a search engine to help look for Reduc drug reduction cost program. So the cost of cancer care and the burden of the drug costs can be a problem sometimes. This group helps to connect people with the companies that can help make that burden a little less intense. So I really encourage you to consider these support options. I also encourage you to talk to your cancer care team if there is something that is gonna prevent you from following through in that recommended plan of care. We really want to help you get through this cancer journey and to be as healthy as possible throughout this process. So now I'd like to take just a little break uh, to see if anyone has any questions. We are going to break uh, in between each of the speakers uh, to allow for these questions. So just know that we'll, we'll allow for opportunities in the future as well. So Nurse Debbie, I oh. recently learned uh, from a friend that was diagnosed with breast cancer about meal train. Are you familiar with meal train? I, I understand the concept. 
Um, I had previously had a contact with them, but it was pre-COVID to be perfectly honest. So well, if you have a new contact, I'd love that information. I don't I'd even have a contact. Share. A friend of mine set one up for our friend that's been diagnosed and, and there's a large group of us at our gym that, you know, said absolutely rallying behind this person. And so she just went on and she set it up for this person. And then we, as the support team, got to sign up for what days and times we wanted to deliver food to her house. And That's she's put awesome. a cooler outside of her house. We, it's a no contact delivery. We all know when we're going to have, and you can choose if you want your reminder two days before or a week before thought that was kind of cool too, but it's like mealtrain.com or .org. I can't remember which one it was, but I thought it was pretty fantastic. So I wanted to, when you were talking about getting your network together, yeah. remembered meal train. And I mean, this is just one of her networks because she goes to the gym and there's probably 20 of us at a rally behind her. And I mean, imagine having 20 people bringing meals when you're going through treatment. Um, it's interesting where your support system comes from sometimes. It's not always direct friends and family, but it can be your gym network too. So, but meal train was one I learned about. So that I would Excellent. share. <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah. And you know, I what I am really amazed about is each of those organizations that I did share with, they have tested the time as far as like we are kind of trying to enter what we hope is post COVID phase and in our new world now. And, you know, it was a hard time for a lot of um, nonprofit organizations. And I am uh, repeatedly impressed with those organizations and their ongoing dedication to really supporting um, cancer patients going, you know, as we go forward. So um, definitely look into those. And just to be really clear, like, those are nonprofit, you know, organizations. These, they are not charging for these services. If, you know, they of course are always open to donations because, you know, providing cancer care in all forms can be very expensive. But uh, please, you know, if, if somebody's asking you for money to support you with your cancer uh, care journey, that is not the right organization. Well, if there are not other questions, I am going to move on without further ado, because my partners have some really amazing information to share with you. Uh, che, why don't you take it away? Thanks so much, Debbie. Um, hi, my name is Che Richardson-Young. I want to say thank you to Joe and to uh, the Northwest Sarcoma Foundation for this opportunity um, to speak with you about radiation therapy. So I... Um, I uh, work here in the oncology uh, clinic at Kaiser, and um, I support patients during their treatment um, and help address symptom management. All right, so a few things to note. Um, radiation is a very targeted and precise treatment. Um, the goal is to focus a really high dose of energy at a treatment site. Um, and to minimize the risk that the cancer will come back. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say here is that um, radiation has been used to treat sarcoma for over 50 years. And um, we know that uh, studies have proven that radiation can improve local control of sarcoma. So let's talk again about reasons to get, some, to get radiation. We know that radiation can do a variety of things. It can eliminate the cancer. It can shrink a tumor either before or after surgery. Um, it can reduce the risk of recurrence and it can also help to palliate um, pain or other symptoms that are associated with later stages of cancer. All right, so a couple um, notes here. Um, it's kind of a visually busy slide. And ultimately what I wanted most people to take out of this is that there's a lot of ways to deliver radiation therapy. So there's external radiation. Um, this is where you have radiation that's sent from a treatment machine into your body. Um, and then you have internal radiation, which is where the radiation is gonna be placed really close with your body. So, um, 
In my experience, most people that are going through radiation for sarcoma are going to get something called intensity modulated radiation therapy or IMRT for short. Um, that's probably most commonly used. Um, but again, there's very many different types of radiation overall. There are also lots of people involved in your care. Um, so that's something to be aware of, uh, an entire team. All right, so um, what I wanted to focus on here is a couple of things. First, you're gonna be meeting with your radiation oncologist. You're going to be reviewing the staging. You're gonna be reviewing previous and upcoming scans. You will um, talk about risk and benefits of treatment. You'll talk about treatment planning and next steps. Um, I always encourage patients to bring lots and lots of questions. Um, if you know there's if you have just a lot of them, just feel free to write them down. It's a really great time to get those questions answered so that you can feel confident in knowing what your next steps are. Uh, the other thing that will be happening typically after the consultation, usually by a week or two, is something called a treatment planning visit. Now, this is typically some type of advanced imaging, like a CT or MRI, and the doctor is going to um, review that imaging in real time to make sure that um, they understand how the, your treatment would go and then make a preliminary plan. After that time, you would typically have a week or two until you'd start radiation, and this is when um, a lot of the, the team that we had just talked about, um, you know, physics, dosimetry, a lot of other folks will come into play to plan the radiation to ensure that the doctor's radiation prescription can be facilitated. So um, kind of on a nuts and bolts level, you'll start treatment, you'll come in, lie down on a radiation table, the radiation um, will tip the first visit will typically be um you know maybe 15 or 30 minutes and then each subsequent visit is just ever so slightly shorter um, you'll also have weekly check-ins um, with your radiation oncology team um, to ensure that you're, you're progressing as we would expect um, we're addressing symptoms that come up and supporting you during this challenging time um, the last thing I want to highlight here is that um, the duration of treatments are really site specific, but in general, um, there's a good chance that probably for sarcoma, you're going to get somewhere between four and six weeks of radiation. So let's talk a little bit about these side effects and how this might impact you. The most common side effect is going to be fatigue. Um, as Debbie had mentioned before, you know, it's really good to kind of come into this with the mindset um, that you might need some additional supports in place. Um, Joe also brought up meal train, which can be a, a really good option as well. Um, so be prepared that, you know, you might um, have your fatigue be more intense over time. Um, allow yourself to take the breaks throughout the day um, and throughout treatment to, to focus on your own needs and try not to expect too much out of yourself um, during treatment. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to talk about is anytime radiation is impacting you, it's gonna be traveling through your skin. Um, that's whether or not this, the tumor or the treatment site is really deep within the body or very superficial. So typical skin reaction side effects are going to be starting out with dry, itchy, or tight skin. And then over time, that will develop into something that looks a bit like a sunburn. Um, note that rare skin reactions are possible, and your treatment team will be able to help address those concerns with you. Um, the other thing I want to talk about here is that there are um, you know, some ways to support yourself with skin care. Um, often the most simple one is just not scratching the itch. Um, but there can be other things that can be really helpful too. Um, avoiding temperature extremes, um, making sure that if it's winter out, you're wearing an additional layer, 
um, making sure that you're avoiding hot tubs, saunas, jacuzzis, and making sure that you're careful about sun exposure to a treatment site during treatment and after treatment, definitely in the summer. The other thing that we're thinking about is using unscented soaps and lotions. Um, and doing these things um, can, can definitely make your time easier. Okay, so um, this is, again, a, a little bit of a visually busy slide, but what I wanted to focus on here is that um, these are not all going to happen to you. Um, what I'm going through in, in this slide is kind of showing, you know, for example, if you're getting radiation to your head and your neck, kind of this region up here, you're probably going to have some sore throat symptoms, maybe voice changes, taste changes, dry mouth. If you are getting treatment to your esophagus or your upper chest, um, you're probably, or even low, you know, your stomach or your abdomen, you're probably going to have some nausea or vomiting, some difficulties with your throat, some symptoms that are, you know, more focused in this lower area. Um, if you are getting treatment to your lower GI um, or pelvic region, you're probably going to have some diarrhea or some bladder symptoms. And then, um, a note here, if you're getting treatment to your bone, you could have an increase in pain temporarily while you're on treatment. Um, lastly, I'd like to talk briefly about hair loss. Um, oftentimes people come into our clinic thinking, I'm getting treatment for cancer, I'm going to lose all my hair. And that's just not typically what we see unless your radiation treatment site is on your head or in an area where you already have a lot of hair, like your back, your chest, maybe your arms in certain cases for certain people. More likely, um, hair loss is gonna be, you know, something that could happen to some people, but might not happen to others. So it might, um, you know, be permanent, it might not. It might grow back in a different color or texture. So just be aware of that. Um, okay, so, I also wanted to just review that there are rare side effects that could be possible, but these do not happen to everyone and they are unexpected. Lastly, I'd like to talk with you a bit about, um, you know, just a reminder that your side effects are going to get better after you're done with treatment. Um, and make sure that you are utilizing medications that are prescribed by your treatment team and, um, and also just keep your radiation oncology treatment team in the know. We're here to help and we want to support you during your time with us. Thank you again for this opportunity. Any questions? You no, know, one thing you had on your first slide was you mentioned the proton therapy radiation. And uh, we are very lucky in the Pacific Northwest to actually have a proton center. Um, it is up here in the Seattle area. Um, and we've had a, a one of the radiation oncolo or oncologists from that clinic actually do a, a research or update night and share um, about proton therapy radiation. So um, I know that you didn't touch on it very much, but if anybody's looking for more information on it, they can always go back into that uh, uh, research or update night information for the proton therapy. But um, thank you for sharing all that. I, I There were some things I, I even learned about the possibilities for radiation. So thank you, Che. I appreciate that. You know, there's two thoughts that along that I had uh, one along what you were saying, Joe, and um, it is that um, <clears throat> oh, I just lost it. The first thing I wanted to say was that you know sometimes patients will say Monday through Friday, you want me to come in every day, and and the thing that I tell them is that. I hear from patients that it takes longer to get to and from the clinics than it does to actually get those treatments. So, you know, in the beginning, you're going to have some longer visits, but then once you get those treatments going, all of your cancer centers are, are amazingly well-oiled machines, and you will be amazed at how quickly they'll be able to get you in and out. And they, they know you have other life things to do, and they care about that. And so, like, if you can't drive across town at a certain time because you know the bridge is up, like tell them, communicate that with them. They're going to do the very best they can to meet your needs where you are. And so this is not a time to be quiet. 
this is a time to be communicating with all your cancer providers as you're going through each of your journeys, regardless of which of those provider teams that is. And I did just remember what I was thinking about with Joe is that we are so blessed in the Northwest. We have multiple cancer centers in Oregon and Washington with sarcoma specialists, which is not the case in a lot of areas. And so we have we have amazing resources here. Yeah, thank you, Joe, for touching on that. And and Debbie, yeah, definitely agree with the point of, um, you know, some people might be traveling more than half of their day just to get a treatment that takes 15 to 30 minutes, but it's also a very, very important treatment. So certainly, yeah, thank you both. All right. If there's not uh, anything else for Che, I think that we can move on to uh, Miss Allison to talk to us about medical oncology and treatments with chemotherapy. Hi, thank you for this opportunity. I'm I'm really excited to be able to share um, my perspective on chemotherapy. Um, my role is as an oncology nurse case manager is I work very closely with the physician. And once the physician has determined your treatment plan, then I step in and I um, do a lot of education. I um, help organize and get things scheduled and I perform and provide symptom management. So that's basically my role. <laughs> so chemotherapy is a generalized term to describe treatment of cancer with medications. That's basically what it is. And so chemotherapy works on cells that multiply and divide rapidly. And so that's basically what cancer is. Cancer is in the very basic form or very basic definition is it's um, a cell in your body that has lost its ability to stop growing. So it just keeps growing and growing and growing until it, um, until it um, causes organ dysfunction or a visible tumor or something like that. Um, uh, oncology or uh, chemotherapy requires multidisciplinary care, um, which includes your medical oncologist, um, pharmacists, um, nurses, um, infusion team, phlebotomists, schedulers. So it takes a village to be able to provide chemotherapy. So the goals of um, on call or chemotherapy is of course to get rid of that cancer. We wanna eradicate it. Um, chemotherapy can also palliate pain and other symptoms. Um, I've seen people who have um, horrible pain and then they get chemotherapy and you know, within six to eight weeks they're out golfing. I mean, that doesn't happen for everybody but it does palliate symptoms. Um, and the um, your team will provide support for side effects of treatment to prevent hospitalization. And most importantly is to maintain your quality of life. Um, so back to um, chemotherapy. So, like I said earlier, chemotherapy targets cells that multiply and divide rapidly. And if that's a cancer cell, yay, we want that. But um, it can also affect um, healthy cells in your body that uh, normally multiply and divide rapidly, such as your bone marrow, um, your skin, and the cells that line your GI tract, hair, um, all those cells multiply and divide rapidly. And so that's where we see some of the side effects come in with um, chemotherapy. Um, but the chemotherapy that you get is very, very individualized. It depends on the stage of your cancer, the type. As Debbie said earlier, there's over 50 types of sarcoma. And so it's not one size fits all. Um, the other consideration is the volume of disease, meaning how much disease is in your body? Has it spread to other places? Other things to consider is your overall health. Um, somebody who has diabetes or heart disease or other 
um, health conditions, um, that's going to um, be a decision um, factor into the decision-making process as well. And also your treatment goals um, are important too. So the doctor's going to talk to you about what you hope to get out of your chemotherapy. Common chemotherapy medications, there's lots of them. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but um, these are just some of the ones that we commonly see with sarcoma. Um, there's going to be some things that you're going to need to do before you get chemotherapy. Um, one of them is to get what we call a porticath. And what that is, it's a, um, for lack of a better word, port that is placed under the skin and it's threaded to one of the large veins in your body. Um, so we can deliver um, chemotherapy without causing harm to your um, peripheral veins. You can also get um, blood draws through that. And um, um, it's a real handy um, thing to have because it eliminates the fear of having to get an IV. Other things that you might need before starting treatment, you might need an echocardiogram because some of the medicines that we give can be irritating to the heart. And so we'll want to make sure that your heart is healthy enough to receive chemotherapy. Common side effects that we see affect the bone marrow. So your bone marrow is where your blood cells are made, white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. And so once you get chemotherapy, it will go in and it will kind of decrease the function of your bone marrow for a little while until your bone marrow kind of wakes up and says, ah, I better make more cells. Um, that's an expected side effect. Um, all the, most of the chemotherapy uh, common ones we see are expected. We know they're going to happen and they're predictable. And so um, we see other side effects in the GI system, such as nausea, of course. Gone are the days where people spend all their time um, in a dark room vomiting. Because along with new um, chemotherapy treatments, they've also developed really, really good antiemetics. And an antiemetic is an anti-nausea medicine. So there's no reason why you can't have um, a good quality of life without nausea and vomiting. Other side effects that we're going to see, whoop, where are we here? Um, we go back. Okay. Um, hair and skin cells are also going to be affected. And so, um, you know, not all chemotherapy causes hair loss. So be very careful about plopping down $150 for a bottle of shampoo that's going to prevent hair loss. There's nothing that um, externally that you can apply that's going to prevent that, um, such as a shampoo or something like that. So um, beware, don't get taken by that. And as Che said earlier, um, fatigue is very common. It's probably the most common side effect of all cancer treatment. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, chemotherapy disrupts the normal function of the bone marrow. This is predictable, it's expected, and chemotherapy is designed around when we expect your bone marrow to recover. Um, if your white blood cells, for some reason, don't recover in time like we expect it, it can cause a delay in treatment because we can't give you more chemo um, if your white blood cell counts are um, too low. Red blood cells have the longest lifespan. They're about 120 days. Um, and so they're less affected. And so um, not, uh, I've only seen maybe one or two times uh, where uh, somebody is so anemic that they can't get chemo. Um, platelets help your blood to clot and those also will delay treatment. So if your um, um, platelets don't come back up as we expect, then um, we'll want to delay your treatment, lower the dose of medication, because we don't want you to have a higher uh, risk of bleeding. Um, sometimes we get platelet transfusions, and so we'll just keep the we'll keep monitoring this, and we monitor these things through a CBC um, 
And that's always done uh, one to two days before your next cycle of chemotherapy. Um, side effects in the GI system, mouth sores, diarrhea, or constipation, um, nausea, vomiting, and sometimes people get heartburn. Current nausea, anti-nausea medicines are really, really effective. So if you have one that isn't working for you, we have a lot of tools in our toolbox to help um, prevent or treat nausea. We can also give you um, IV fluids to help support you if you're not able to drink adequate fluids. But important uh, to say is using medications proactively um, as instructed by your team is going to provide you with the best outcomes related to nausea and vomiting. Um, like I said before, um, most common side effect of skin is your hair loss. Um, and like I said earlier, not all uh, chemotherapy causes hair loss. Um, you can have other side effects of the skin, such as nail changes, rashes. Um, some people can become more sensitive to the sun. So you want to be extra careful in the Sunday, sunny days if the sun ever comes back and um, I think it will eventually, um, but you want to be very uh, kind to your skin um, and prevent um, overexposure to the sun. <coughs> Excuse me. There are some common and late side effects with chemotherapy, and your doctor will go over you over these with you. Um, sometimes we have um, infertility um, can induce menopause. Um, as hormone changes happen with your chemotherapy, you can have be at higher risk for osteoporosis. But these are things that your um, oncologist will talk to you about and monitor you for. The risks of late side effects kind of definitely depends on the type of treatment you have. Sometimes the late term side effects are unknown with some of these newer drugs that we have. And we don't know what they're going to be because these drugs haven't been out on the market long enough to know what's going to happen in 30 years. Important thing to know is to include your oncology team in managing side effects. We can't help you if we don't know. If you're having a side effect, don't hold and say, oh, it'll get better, it'll get better. Um, because your um, side effects can worsen over time. Um, if, if you have uh, problems eating and drinking because of your side effects, um, if you have uncontrolled diarrhea that can lead to dehydration and electrolyte imbalances, um, we'll need to know if you're not able to perform your activities of daily living. Again, this is all about promoting quality of life and helping you through your, your chemotherapy. We also wanna know if you're, um, your family's saying that you're confused or disoriented if you have shortness of breath, or you have unusual pain. These are all reasons that you'll need to co contact your oncology team or your um, oncology nurse. A word of caution about nutraceuticals and other alternative treatments. There's an abundance of information out there on the power of herbs and natural products for the prevention and cure of cancer. It's all very, very compelling, but most of these supplements have not been studied in clinical trials. And not only have they not been studied, it's all anecdotal evidence, meaning my friend or I knew somebody who took this and they had um, cancer, but you don't know anything about that other person's cancer. Using supplements during chemotherapy and radiation can cause unpredictable side effects. It can either cause your uh, chemotherapy to work too much and cause uh, worse side effects, or it can block your chemotherapy and you won't get the full therapeutic effect. It's also impossible to know or to test all of the available um, herbs and nutraceuticals that are available out there with the current chemotherapies that we have. We just don't have the time resources to test all of that. And so you could be um, really harming yourself if you um, take those things. 
There are some reliable sources of information out there. The National Institutes of Health and the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Medicine. They actually do test these things and say, yep, this works or no, we can't say it works. And so um, that is a very, very good resource to get to know. Um, if you are unable to maintain your weight or find nutrition a challenge, um, using uh, protein drinks or nutritional supplements like protein drinks is perfectly acceptable. Please communicate with your cancer team on any non-prescription supplements you're utilizing before you begin therapy. If you want, if you're really intrigued by something, please do talk to us because we'll do our best to check and make sure that there's no interactions between the chemotherapy and the substance that you want to take. But generally speaking, we do not support using nutraceuticals or herbs during chemotherapy. Another common thing that people ask about um, is intimacy during chemotherapy. Chemotherapy medications can be detected in saliva, vaginal secretions, and semen. However, it's unknown if this can be harmful to your partner. So because of that, we recommend using a barrier method during sexual intercourse for at least seven days after each dose of chemotherapy. Also, the most common sexual side effect from cancer treatment is the loss of desire. And that is, and that is perfectly acceptable. Um, cancer treatments can also um, affect the person who may not feel well. You, you just don't feel good. You're nauseated, maybe you have diarrhea. Um, or you have a, a new struggle with body image. These things are all perfectly um, normal and they happen, but it's important to talk, you can talk to your um, healthcare team, but most importantly, communicate with your partner. You might have to adjust your routine. Chemotherapy um, can, um, you may have a three week cycle, for example, and the last week before your chemo, you may feel pretty good. So you may have to adjust your routine and plan ahead um, and um, say, okay, well, this week I'm feeling pretty good. So uh, talk to your partner, maybe experiment with other kinds of intimacy. But again, you can talk to your cancer team about that. What happens when treatment is completed? Ah, we go to surveillance. Each of your oncology specialists will speak to you about the duration of their involvement in your uh, care journey. So what we usually see is after treatment, you'll have a period of time where you'll uh, not see the oncologist. This can be kind of scary for people because you're so used to seeing them so often. And I get lots and lots of calls about people who, who say, is this normal? Is, does this mean my cancer's back? And, and so we can help you with that. But generally in speaking, you'll get a physical exam, maybe labs and um, imaging every three to six months for the first two years. After that, monitoring extends out. So you may go to an every six month schedule for three to five years, and then it may go to yearly. And so uh, rest assured, we'll keep close eye on you. And it's important to keep us informed of what's going on with your body there really isn't um, an inappropriate question to ask your care team. And any questions? You know, Allison, something that came to mind to me when you were talking about intimacy and just another uh, resource I want to throw out to people is uh, the Live Strong Foundation. They have a, a lot of information about things you can do if you are having impacts on your intimacy or sexual um, desires, et cetera. Um, because like you said, there is a variety of ways that cancer can actually really impact this very important element of what makes us who we are. Um, and so there are lots of resources out there and, you know, it can be hard to say, well, let's talk about sex when we're talking about cancer, but that is actually also a human need. And it's really important that we meet those needs. So don't, 
this is not the time to get shy. Like, let us have it. Let us know what's going on. Yeah. I I mean, a lot of people um, get embarrassed about asking it. Um, Before I got um, involved in sarcoma, I did a lot with prostate cancer and Mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of very frank conversations with a lot of gentlemen about the side effects of their treatment. So it's, it's not embarrassed. It's not embarrassing to us and we're here to help you. And again, it all comes back to the quality of life. We want you to have, we want to maximize the quality of life during treatment. I know that's a a target area for a patient education night for us is to have a sexual health conversation one. Um, We haven't found a a good person to do that one yet, but we're working on it. So Mm -hmm. Uh, I think you could definitely spend a full hour talking about it. Yep. And that's exactly it. And for sure, who knows what questions will pop up for sure. So yeah, I uh, definitely think it's an under talked about subject. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I know that's on our, that is on our target list. So hopefully that'll be a a topic coming up. Um, Maybe not this year, but in 2025. So, Um, you know, as you were talking about chemo and I, I shared earlier, I had a friend who was recently diagnosed and she started her chemo on Wednesday. One of the things that she said, which I've never heard anybody say, my mom went through treatment. I have a family friend going through treatment. No one's ever said it. She goes, when she was, she got her port in, she was having her first chemo treatment. She goes, she actually could feel it when the chemo hit her body for the very first mm-hmm. time. And she said, I, she goes, it was a shock and her body started, she kind of freaked out a little bit. And um, she says, once her body adjusted and adapted, it was okay. But she had that, you know, brief moment where her body kind of panicked and you mm-hmm. never hear anybody say that. So it was just kind of interesting to hear um, from somebody that, you know, what it's, what it's really like sometimes. Um, and obviously mm-hmm. everybody's going to act maybe a little bit differently, but I thought that one was kind of a an interesting comment to hear. So, cause I'd never heard it. Yeah. There are some chemotherapies that can cause some um, in infu- what we call infusion reactions, uh, taxane specifically, um, a taxol is made from the bark of the yew tree. Um, and so it's a thick and sticky medicine. And so drug manufacturers put a, a solvent in it. It's a common drug solvent that some people can have kind of a flush reaction to when they first get it. So that's a pretty common side effect okay. with Taxol and Taxotere. Um, and so we pre-medicate to hopefully prevent those, mm-hmm. but that is not, it is a very common side effect, yeah. especially with uh, Taxanes. Yeah, I thought it was interesting, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think that's actually like another plug for the role of peer mentorship, you know? Mm-hmm having a conversation with somebody who has been on a similar pathway that you are taking and who has like made it to the other side. Um, I think that that has a whole layer of encouragement as well as like a body of knowledge. None of us as your healthcare providers are truly going to be able to give you, you know, even with all of our years of experience, unless one of us have actually like had a personal diagnosis, like we we're going to get as empathetic and as close to your experience as we can. But like someone who's actually been there and done that is going to be able to provide that, that extra layer that maybe might be that support that you're looking for. Yeah. Every person's um, experience is different Mm -hmm. um and um your chemo like we mentioned i think we've talked about this uh, several times your individual treatment is going to be different than somebody else's some of our chemotherapy regimens are given inpatient and they require that you take them four to five days as an inpatient some of them are an hour long some of them are two or three hours so it just kind of depends on the medication and the regimen that you're going to get. Some of our chemotherapies are very, very long as far as they take a year to, to get through. So they're given at different intervals for a year. And some of them are six treatments and you're done. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So chemotherapy can be a very, very, well, is a very individualized experience and having somebody that went through it is going to be very valuable to help you through and navigate that. Yeah. And I know just, I don't know how much on Debbie, I don't know how much, you know, but Immerman angels, they do contact me. Um, con- do they? not constantly, but I would say at least four to five times a year, I get requests for us to search our database 
to see if we know we anybody that's been diagnosed. And they do really work at trying to match diagnoses and age and sex and whatever else the, the person searching is asking for. So, and I, you know, we strongly recommend that if you are a um, survivor in NED is to volunteer and be that mentor for the next person. So, uh, but yeah, you know, it's good to have that resource for sure. I was looking up earlier about how many angels they had because I was really, really impressed. Um, yeah, but the question is how many sarcoma <laughs> right. angels do they have? Right. <laughs> That's the harder part. Um, and then, you you know, that gets yeah. us back to like where we're in a very uh, rare and special sort of yep. situation yep. here in sarcoma land. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then I'm, we all know it can present, you could be the only person in the world where it's presented in that one place in that one part of the body. So, cause I know that was the case at one point in time, we couldn't find a match for them. Um, and they were struggling to find a match through all their resources. So, but, um, yeah. So, well, his, I think that's everybody unless Christy's going to pop on and just surprise us. <laughs> oh, there is our reference. Oh, there's all your references. Throwing yeah. that up there. So, um, Lots and lots of great um, organization and research in this body of uh, resources. Nice. So, great to have. Um, well, I want to say thank you to, Nur oh, we always call her Nurse Debbie. So Nurse Debbie and her team, Allison, Che, and Christy, um, thank you so much for being here this evening, sharing your wealth of knowledge, uh, and just excited that you guys were willing and able to do this for us. So, and I know I'm sure if we come back at you again, you'll, you'll say yes. <laughs> so, um, and I know that I, like I heard from a, one of the people that was supposed to be here this evening, he did, he felt ill. So we do record this uh, and it does go onto our website. So we'll be able to share it out um, to everybody and anybody that registered, and then it just will live there on. So you guys will be mortalized on our uh, on our on our um website so but thank you again and to sonia i see you over there so thank you for joining us this evening and um everybody uh we will hopefully see you at our next either researcher update night which is in february uh which is oh and look at that oh yeah well there you go <laughs> and then there's the dragon slayer walks in september i like it um we got a couple more months to go for that <laughs> Oh, I start soliciting now. I start okay. right All away. Right. They we already know. It. We love it. Um, yeah, so obviously we have a research update out on February 21st with Dr. Loggers. And then uh, lots of different ones are coming up for that. And then, as I mentioned, Hope Grows here in April. And as Debbie just mentioned, Dragon Slayer Walk in September. So hopefully all of you, Alice and Che and Christy, we will see you out there along with Sonia. So, all right, everybody have a good night and thank you for being here. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much. Take care.